So uh, stage three for Anthony Anderson. Looking forward to your presentation. Go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for that warm introduction. I'm Tony Anderson, uh, Director of Marketing and Business Development with Precision Combustion. Whoops. Oh, just to the right. Just a second. Okay. We jumped the gun here a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, there we go. Fantastic. I'm the uh, Director of Marketing and Business Development with Precision Combustion. And so uh, we're going to be talking about microlith catalytic reactors and systems. A little bit about uh, Precision Combustion or PCI before we get started. We're a uh, small business in uh, North Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut's a small state between Boston and New York. Um, we're uh, developing um, uh, catalytic reactors and systems for the energy sector. We have two platform technologies, microlith catalytic reactors, which is what I'll focus on today, as well as uh, RCL catalytic combustors. Uh, the microlith catalytic reactors can be used for a variety of applications, including oxidation or burners, uh, fuel reforming and processing, and uh, a Sabatier methanation as well. And we're developing this for a variety of applications. Our collaborators include the U.S. government, uh, both large and small corporations, as well as uh, universities and national laboratories. Uh, give you an idea a little bit about our product uh, application space. Or we're involved in the power for fuel cell systems. That would be auxiliary power units or APUs, uh, generators, gensets, uh, uh, applications for vehicles such as aircraft and ships, uh, internal combustion engine type of tactical generators, uh, propulsion systems for uh, unmanned vehicles, UXV, uh, unmanned everything, UAVs, UUVs, UGVs, and all those other letters, uh, as well as reformers for industrial systems for industrial customers. We also have efforts going on in combustion, as you can see, including uh, fuel cell system uh, uh, catalytic oxidizers, either inverting, inerting burners or anode gas oxidizers, as well as some air cleaning, such as desulfurization uh, for reformate, and then chemicals manufacture, including things like a Sabatier uh, methanation. The microlith technology is a, a mesh uh, substrate type of catalyst. Uh, it's, it's very small and durable. And you can see a cross section of one of these little meshes where you see the layer of wire with the interfacial layer and the wash coated catalyst on top. We have automated coating facilities, so we make these in rolls. And so that helps uh, keep the cost uh, very reasonable. And we have automated uh, uh, coding and as, as well as the quality assurance and quality control processes in place. And we hold multiple patents on catalyst structure and then methods and apparatus of how to, how to do these various catalytic reactors. And typically these reactors are, um, one of the values we bring is we're ultra compact and lighter in weight uh, with high heat and mass transfer which uh, tend to make uh, better catalytic reactions for the applications that you're focused on. Uh, and a bit of an explanation as to why it's better is that you're comparing the mesh catalyst to the what you'd see like a catalytic converter of your automobile, the honeycomb mesh. Those type of honeycombs form boundary layers, and so if you have catalysts on the surface, they don't do as much work effectively. Whereas our microlith catalyst, very little to no boundary layer formation. There's also intermixing regions between the between the wires, and so you have a better catalytic reaction, a more selective reaction. A physical example of how this works is in comparison, again, on an oxidation type reaction, what you find is, is you'll have two and a half meters long of monolith, and it'll be a, a tenth of a centimeter, I'm sorry, two and a half centimeters, and a tenth of a centimeter long, which is about seven microlith layers doing the work. It does the same amount of work between the two devices, so you have a, effectively a 20 fold uh, size reduction, so it's more efficient use of the catalyst surface area. And again, because these are made up of little wires, you have a very uh, rapid thermal response. And so when you go to the uh, gas temperature, as these wires are exposed to a hot gas, it'll come up within under a second, where a monolith would take several seconds or a pellet-type catalyst would take several seconds, things of that nature. Getting, there we go. Sorry about that. So we have a few, di th three different... Um, Three different uh, fuel reforming processes that we've developed. Uh, catalytic partial oxidation, which is fuel mixed with air. The uh, catalytic autothermal reforming, which is fuel mixed with air and steam. And then catalytic steam reforming, which we, have, we call it that because we use a catalyst also for the, end of the exothermic side or the burner side. And so in that process, you just have fuel and steam. 
We made them for a variety of applications, for automotive, industrial applications, uh, for um, liquid hydrocarbons scaling from the kilowatts to the megawatts, and uh, steam reformers. We have a couple different sizes at three and also at 10 kilowatts thermal of uh, throughput. Developing those further into fuel processes for fuel cells, what we take for a solid oxide fuel cell application is, is we have the self removal, the steam generator, the controls, the heat exchanger, any burners that are necessary. We've also de developed water recovery technology for fuel cell systems, such as you can make operate these in a water neutral aspect and the fuel and air mixing in one of these reactors. If we add that to uh, a water gas shift reactor, then we can also go uh, utilize this for HTPEM. And if you add prox or other separation to separate hydrogen, then you can go after a low temperature PEM. And of course, there's other fuel cell solutions uh, that we can apply our technology to as well. I mentioned the, uh, the water gas shift reactor. There's a reaction for that. So we have that technology and preferential oxidation of CO technology. And we've worked with companies that have um, uh, membrane separation type technology for when you need pure hydrogen. Or uh, there's a, you could, of course, add a PSA to that. And we have ongoing efforts uh, in these areas. So the commercial applications that we're looking for are air aircraft, truck APUs, marine APUs, and the like, recreational vehicles, uh, fuel cell range extenders, if that uh, makes sense for that application, and industrial syngas applications as well, where they need uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide containing gas for an industrial application. They call, it, call that uh, HICO. Um, but then we do a lot of our development work under U.S. government funding, and so a lot of these are for military applications, and most of these have military analogs uh, for that. So one of our uh, main innovations is a sulfur-tolerant logistics fuel reformer. So we can convert diesels or military fuels, biofuels or alcohols into a sulfur-free syngas, hydrogen and carbon monoxide containing gas. And so it's uniquely compact and lightweight. In fact, we trade and we trademarked, we put the fuel in fuel cells. So it allows um, solid oxide fuel cells to use diesel or military fuels, including those up to 3,000 parts per million uh, with sulfur. Uh, and we're able to, re to reform the fuel and, and remove the sulfur such that it's uh, usable with a solid oxide fuel cell. And if you add the water gas shift reactor, then you can make it usable for a high temperature PEM fuel cell as well. So in comparison with other options, when you look at it at a system level, we tend to have a lower weight up to three times and a smaller size up to six times. Uh, and so we also have faster response and lower pressure drop through our system because of this and hopefully a significantly reduced cost because you're using less material. So our designs uh, support complete solid oxide fuel cell integration. So we're able to integrate fuel processors and do the reformate flow, the thermal balance, and the electrical control handshakes between the stack and the load that's pulled from the stack as well as the fuel reformer and processor itself. Here's an example of a, a, fuel process, a fuel reformer that would be used for a one kilowatt electrical size solid oxide fuel cell in comparison to a standard American coffee mug, I guess, and a standard American uh, soda can. Uh, it gives you an idea of the size. Um, we actually have one at my booth, which is two stands over, uh, D761, uh, so hopefully you can stop by and we can chat more afterwards. But this uh, reformer has the catalyst, the steam generator, uh, the steam generating uh, heat exchanger, a startup, we use a glow plug, and then a sulfur cleanup, all within a compact module. And it's uh, uh, applicable to up to 3,000 ppm sulfur-containing fuels. And we operate, again, the, the device under water, nu not water neutral, low steam to carbon ratio uh, operation modes. Uh, a little bit bigger system, this is 40 kilowatts thermal, so say maybe it's uh, 10, or 10 to 15 kilowatts electrical size reformer. So again, uh, comparing it to a standard coffee mug, uh, it's about 17 kilograms for the same uh, components within that device. And when you operate the device, it uses very low parasitic power, so something that's actually a little smaller, one to two kilowatts, it's uh, less than 100 watts electrical uh, parasitic load. A little bit bigger uh, fuel processor. This is 25 kilowatts thermal auto thermal reformer. All the dimensions you see are in inches, actually. So it's 5 to 6.6 .6 inches in diameter. Uh, this would be used for a, um, it was actually designed for a low temperature PEM, but you can certainly uh, use this embodiment for a high temperature PEM as well. The low temperature PEM, you would need a palladium membrane separator to uh, go along with this. And so to give you an idea of some data, since this is supposed to be a technical talk, there's some, uh, a uh, chart showing 1,000 hours of runtime, 100% fuel conversion efficiency, and between 80 and 85% reforming efficiency, which is very close to the maximum that, uh, that uh, 
you would calculate to be that you could have. And so we did uh, this this uh, operation, steam to carbon, uh, at uh, 0 0.9, and this was what we call a low sulfur version. So it's 400 parts per million sulfur or less to do this do this operation. So as of now, we've actually had multiple thousand hour runs to uh, show durability. We have very similar uh, characteristics uh, where it's a, a very stable performance. An idea of some of the um, uh, compositions you might get out of it. This is actually JP8 composition. The top line is what your calculations of equilibrium tell you you should get out of the process. The second line is actually what we do get out of the process. So it's very close to what equilibrium calculations say they should be. Then also, if you added a water gas shift reactor onto this as well, it gives you an idea of the, um, the hydrogen output and the carbon monoxide output that you care about uh, coming out of that system. So again, a reforming efficiency of around uh, 85%, between 80 and 85%. And another key for using fuel cells, of course, is you have to have very low sulfur to almost zero sulfur and much below 50 ppm and higher hardy carbons uh, with your fuel processor if you're going to be successful. An idea of a scale up, here's an example of a one megawatt thermal ATR system. So it would be the ATR with all those components. Uh, and it would include a water gas shift reactor. The picture in the center doesn't have that. It just has the, um, the injector and the fuel reformer and the steam generator, uh, et cetera, with a balance of plant controls. But it gives you an idea of what the size of this would be for something um, you know, that large, about six feet in deep uh, by seven feet high, and about three and a half feet wide. And so it's a modular fuel processing system that we're looking to integrate with uh, modular fuel cell stack uh, components. Here's an example of a, a, um, an interesting uh, reformer that we developed is a one megawatt thermal. It's for uh, volatile organic compounds. So this reformer was actually provided to an industrial equipment company who integrated it into a process at a uh, automotive company, actually Ford Motor Company of Canada. And so they uh, use that to reform the paint solvents from their painting process uh, to provide that to a fuel cell stack or you could put it into an, uh, an internal combustion engine generator too if you'd like. And scaling up even further, here's an example of a natural gas device that we developed. That's 5 megawatts thermal of throughput, uh, so to go from natural gas to syngas. This is for an industrial application, so we've tested this for 1,000 hours of durability. The target is 8,000 hours of durability, so in typically in industrial plants, you don't want to shut things down very often. So you need to run for about a year or so, and then they do their annual maintenance on some of these things. Switching gears a bit, we're going to talk about the microlith um, steam reformer technology we have. And we actually have a very small unit, again, two stands over at uh, D76-1. Uh, and what our technology essentially is, it's a tube within a tube. So in the center tube, you'll have your endothermic steam reforming catalyst. And in the annulus or the tube around the tube would be your exothermic catalyst. And so it's a catalytic uh, heater or a catalytic oxidizer to provide the heat that the steam reforming reaction requires. So these designs typically have lower pressure drop and higher bed utilization if you compare them to using a, a bead or a packed bed type catalyst. Uh, the rapid thermal response and the better heat transfer microlith also brings benefit to this. And so because you're also using a catalytic oxidizer instead of a flame uh, stabilized burner, you have better uh, thermal uniformity throughout the process, which uh, helps with um, having a better overall process to get the composition of reformate that you'd like for your process. Just to summarize the benefits, you can read the slide, but typically we have lower peak temperatures in this operation, so you can use more standard materials of construction. Uh, you have a higher heat flux going through this smaller reactor, and so you have the uniform temperature distribution, which helps avoid any kind of carbon buildup or coke formation. We have low acoustics uh, because we're not using a flame, and uh, no NOx and, and very minimal CO coming out of the device um, on the burner side. And again, uh, you minimize the cold spots, so that helps with, um, you can tolerate actually trace amounts of sulfur on the steam reforming side. And we actually have been able to do steam reforming with 1 to 2 ppm sulfur, which um, uh, we haven't been able to find anyone else to do at the moment. Um, and we also achieve good thermodynamic efficiency at operating at a lower steam to carbon ratio, so you don't use as much water uh, when you operate our, our technology. So looking at a prototype steam reactor, here's a 500 hour test in this case for the steam reformer and you see around 70 mole percent on a dry basis hydrogen was produced by this and complete, complete uh, fuel conversion to C1 products and we, this was operated on uh, synthetic diesel type fuels as well as some dodecane as a, as a test bench so it would make about uh, 8 standard liters per minute of hydrogen which t comes out to about uh, a kilogram of hydrogen per day for this uh, smaller type device 
Here's an example of a test setup of uh, our technology. So this is a steam reformer on a test cart. So you have a steam generator here. You have a steam reformer lengthwise on the top. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment with laptop control. Inside, you have uh, data acquisition equipment and mass flow controllers to operate this device. And so we provide uh, carts like this for uh, uh, test and demonstration. For example, uh, fuel cell stack companies uh, uh, lease these or buy these from us for evaluating their stacks on real fuels rather than blending um, hydrogen or carbon monoxide gases. Here's a picture of the steam reformer for a 7 to 10 kilowatt thermal. So, so this, I believe this is about 18 to 24 inches long and, and, and um, about 3 inches in diameter. Um, but you can see that the, typically the flow of, of the, of the uh, air, fuel, and water and the heat into the device as well. So here's an example of taking that uh, test cart that I showed you a picture of, and, and in a test we, we um, integrated this with a palladium membrane separation technology. And so you can see some of the data here. It had seven, 77, almost 78% uh, separation efficiency, generated about 17 standard per liters per minute of hydrogen in this particular device. We did that for a customer. And so these are examples of some of the fuel reformer test carts, steam, steam reformers, autothermal reformers. We can also do uh, catalytic partial oxidation reformers uh, for either customers to get familiar with operating a fuel reformer or a fuel processor or for stack testing or other component downstream testing uh, of that, that uh, our customers and collaborators may be developing. Uh, we also, you can add a water gas shift reactor if you wanted to do a high temperature PEM or, or add a palladium membrane type device for low temperature PEM uh, evaluation and testing. And all this uh, within the cabinet would have your balance, balance of plant components, mass flow controller, controllers, and the uh, software so that you can essentially have push button operation to pipe the gas directly into your stack testing device. We've also provided uh, turnkey syngas uh, generation units. They call this HICO, hydrogen carbon monoxide for industry. And these are two, uh, two units that were provided that take up about half the size of this stage, and they're maybe this high. I uh, believe it's about 45 kilowatts thermal of output in these devices. These were natural gas autothermal reformers that were sold to a, uh, a customer of ours that was developing a technology downstream. So they were able to avoid having multiple bottles of hydrogen or carbon monoxide, especially their safety engineers were concerned about having multiple bottles of carbon monoxide in a factory um, uh, setting. Uh, these two devices uh, have been operating for over 4,000 hours in intermittent use uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so, and they've made over 50,000 normal meters cubed uh, per syngas, which is uh, a lot of money if you do the calculations uh, on, on uh, what hydrogen or carbon monoxide would cost uh, on a bottle basis. Uh, a newer technology that we've developed, and it actually has uh, some relevance in the uh, power-to-gas scheme that's uh, gaining in popularity and interest here, here in Germany and, and possibly throughout the world at some point. Spadier reaction is a well-defined reaction that was discovered a long time ago. Uh, but you take carbon dioxide and mix it with hydrogen, and you can make methane and some water uh, doing that. So we've demonstrated this at laboratory scale under some NASA funding and also some uh, customer funding as well. A customer uh, wanted to evaluate this process at the lab scale as well. So this makes, I believe, about a standard liter per minute uh, of methane coming out of it. And so we're looking to uh, explore this um, suitability of this approach and this technology with power-to-gas system integrators or um, electro electrolyzer companies that uh, may be involved in teams and consortiums trying to um, effectively apply this technology. But the unit itself, because it uses the mesh catalyst, it should have lower pressure adopt than a, a pellet or foam type of approach, which pellets are typically the approach used today for methanation at the large scale. We've also provided uh, numerous uh, catalytic oxidizers, and here's some examples of them, uh, whether it's uh, a few hundred watts thermal all the way up to 50 kilowatts thermal, depending upon the uh, application. So we provide these uh, uh, reactors or oxidizers for uh, customers that are either doing projects or product development such that you can either use them as an anode gas oxidizer, you can use it as a system start burner to heat up your system, you can use it as a nerding burner to uh, remove all the oxygen off the anode before you start up the system and nert the anode. And again, it's a scalable technology, so we can go from the watt size to the kilowatt size. Um, that's all I have today. I ended about five minutes early, so I apologize if I talk too fast. But please come visit us at uh, D76-1, two stands down. And there's my contact information if you'd like to uh, get a hold of me. Uh, and uh, I guess the floor is open for any questions, right? That's true, Thank Tony. You. Thank you very much. This is your applause for your presentation. Thank you very much for this. Excellent presentation. Are there any questions from your side? So please raise your hand. It's not the case at the moment. 
I'm not an expert, I have to tell you, Tony. But you know, I, I see uh, the United States and, and seeing this this big uh, shale gas boom, and I, I think about uh, may that also influence the steam reforming or the efforts in steam reforming? Will there be more more and more steam reforming? You see a lot of electrolyzers here in, in Europe and Germany. Right. I probably United States are rather more in steam reforming, aren't they? Yeah, at the at the moment it's more reforming, and and it, and it, it is an issue at the um, at the wellhead level. You do produce natural gas when you produce oil. Or if you're doing shale gas, uh, you want to produce that as gas. Uh, one of the issues is that many of these uh, fossil fuel production formations may not be on the pipeline grid. And so how do you get that to your customer, to your market? And there's different ways of doing that. You can you know, compress it and then ship it. Again, it, all of it comes down to how expensive it is to access that type of gas. Um, one of the things we're looking at, because we're so much compact and lightweight, we can actually be sited either on oil platforms or out in the middle of nowhere to take, this, take the gas and convert it into syngas. There are other companies, uh, including some here uh, in Europe and in the UK especially, that are doing um, uh, gas-to-liquid type t technologies, because then, then you can convert that gas into a easily storable liquid. And if you send a truck out there once a week to em empty the tank and then ship it to market, it's a, it's a, a, a you know, much more practical solution for those kinds of things, yes. It really is, indeed. Any questions from your side? You can give this question, or you can visit, uh, Tony, just uh, two booths this way, 76-1. Uh, yes. You can find him all the day uh, today and tomorrow also. Thank you very much once again for your presentation. Thank you very much, and Dr. Shane, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, Al. So the next presentation will take place in uh, eight minutes' time. It will be at uh, 2 o'clock, and uh, we will hear Dr. Benedikt Tanke. He is the R&D manager of Next Energy, EWE Forschungszentrum für Energietechnologie e.V., and he will talk about make the best of the sun, meeting thermal, and electrical energy demands. So stay tuned, have a coffee on the house. We will start in eight minutes. Thank you.